Right, first of all, thank you guys for coming. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's been a great trip here to Israel. Thanks to the Data Boutique for inviting us and having us when you also speak for us. Uh, beautiful country. Uh, uh, so, first of all, before we start, like, how many of you already know Presto? Okay, half. Okay. Oh, it's great. And how many of you actually run Presto in production today? Okay, I use. Not bad. Ten percent. Use. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, uh, that's actually excellent. Um, Twitter. Okay. So, because some of you don't know uh, much about Presto, I will just start with a quick introduction. I don't want to spend too much time on this because there's a lot of new, exciting things uh, in performance and Kubernetes. Uh, well, let me do this quickly, right? So Presto uh, was developed uh, in 2012, 2013, uh, early days of Facebook. They ran into scale issues earlier than anybody else. Uh, um, so they quickly discovered they need a fast interactive SQL engine that will allow them to be run at <coughs> scale with much faster than previously existing tools like Hive. Which they also developed uh, back in the day, right? So, so Presto was sort of the answer to interactive uh, SQL over big data uh, within Facebook initially. What they also realized is that uh, you know, data obviously is massive data sitting in HDFS and other big data stores, but they have more than one. Uh, in addition to HDFS, they also have a massive uh, sharded MySQL installation. And we're talking about hundreds and thousands of nodes keeping data. Relational form sharded across many machines. Uh, they also had a bunch of proprietary internal stores. So they quickly realized they want to enable their own SQL users, their own analysts, uh, to query not just into the fact, but actually arbitrary data sources. Right? So when the Presto was designed first, uh, and that uh, you know, big kudos to the founders of the project at Facebook. Uh, some of you may know Martin, Dane, and David been, uh, here uh, a few months ago for, for, for a small conference. They designed it so that uh, it can run, first of all, scale because it can run many, many machines uh, in an entity fashion, but also the storage was completely abstracted. Um, so you can actually write a plugin called Connector to, to sort of do translation between the underlying data store, which may have nothing to do with database. Uh, in the relational form uh, and tables, uh, and sort of expose that as a virtual table for Presto to put in. Um, and in addition, we can actually mount many different data sources and catalogs to Presto, and Presto will be able to query all of them as if they were just different sets of tables and you can join between two different data sources, so you can take a HDFS table and a MySQL table and join them together uh, using, uh, using Presto. Okay? And because Presto is a SQL engine, it's compute only, completely separated from storage, um, you know, it's easy to scale those things independently. Um, so you can have a large, very large thousands of nodes of HDFS, but uh, have maybe 10 Presto clusters, uh, 100 nodes each, right? And, and so sort of change those as, as your needs grow and change and, and so on. But flexibility is very important. Um, in addition to that, uh, Presto speaks natural uh, ANSI SQL, standard ANSI SQL, so you can use arbitrary tools, uh, whether that's a PI tool from like, companies like Tableau, for example, or Looker. Uh, it could be uh, a notebook, uh, like Jupyter Notebook, or how many things it is. could be um, an open source, modern PI tool, such as SuperSet, for example, uh, or, or, or you know, Power BI, which comes from Microsoft, right? Standard DBC and ODBC interfaces work for Presto, so you can use arbitrary tools that your analysts uh, internally are used to. You don't have to retrain them um, and just plug in Presto as if it was yet another database. Now. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions during the presentation, just ask immediately, right? Um, don't wait till the end. Um, yeah, so you all get. <coughs> Sorry? Somehow Kafka doesn't sit well. I mean, it's not like a database. So, so what um, are what you query at the moment? Right, right. So, so this is a very good question, right? So I mentioned some of the, those data sources are not really uh, naturally representing data in relational form. Uh, Kafka is uh, an example, right? Uh, 
uh, I would say, you know, MongoDB is also not just a classic uh, schema, right? So how do you do that, right? So in the Kafka specifically, so Kafka is, the, you know, it's a, a host of topics, and each in each topic you have many events, right? So one way to expose that relational form is to, to map the topic as a table, um, and then map uh, columns in your events as relational models, right? And in that way, before you can you can configure that mapping in a, in a configuration file and essentially let person know, oh, this is a table called uh, you know my log events, and the schema is as this, right? Um, so very. In case, in case of Kafka, your events could be Avro, uh, you know, encoded in Avro or based on some other format, right? So first, obviously, you need to understand how to parse those uh, and expose those individual columns, right? And all that logic happens within a connector, right? Which is piece of software, right? So first, I can put all those connectors that are listed here already. Um, the, some of the recent ones that were developed by the community are Batch Kudu. Some of you might be familiar with that, uh, especially if you're coming from the Caldera stack, it's, it's, a, it's sort of like semi relational uh, big data store. Elasticsearch at the very end, uh, something that Uber contributed um, in the, uh, quite recently. Uh, they discovered that they do have some data in Elastic and wanted to query that um, with SQL, so that uh, so have to uh, learn other tools um, to leverage this data. Uh, some of those connectors are coming from Starburst exclusively, as well as Oracle and Teradata, uh, for our legacy uh, data warehousing products and connect those. But we can provide uh, uh, support for that as well. Um, uh, another great thing about Presto is that all those connectors uh, were written by, some of them were written by, by, by Facebook, some of them were written by Starburst, some of them were written by some other community members. Basically, whoever has a need to develop a connector for a specific data service that's not yet on this list, it's a simple Java API. It takes you know, between, uh, I would say, a week and three months to build a connector, depending on complexity and whether it needs to be parallel, how complex is the mapping, right? But anyone can develop a connector, right? And contribute that. Uh, or you can hire someone to build one for you. Uh, uh, okay. Specifically, at Starburst, we have plans to build connectors for. Um, IBM 2 we see that a lot in, in legacy uh, enterprises, um, especially banks, uh, and, and also some modern enterprises are choosing Snowflake or Cloud Data Warehouse. So again, we are, we are going to build a connector to Snowflake um, so that we can pull that from Presto um, as well. One well, question. Yeah. Presto and Amazon 3 effectively means Athena. How are you going to address this? Yeah, uh, well, Amazon S3 obviously is open for query from any source, right? In reality, um, on Amazon World, Presto and Amazon 3 means Athena. What would in, incite me to run well, my own Presto cluster to access it to now we use Athena, right? Sure. So actually there's, uh, there's not only Athena, right? There's like, multiple ways you can run Presto on Amazon. Uh, Athena is one. Uh, there's also EMR Presto that's sitting on the EMR platform, which is uh, AWS managed to do offering. So, so there are these two choices out of the box served by, by Amazon um, already. Um, you know, obviously you can run it on your own. Uh, there is a cloud offering from us um, as well. So there are many options to run Presto. Uh, the question is like, why would I consider running myself versus uh, the managed service as Athena? Um, uh, I would say uh, Athena is great if you are just starting with uh, with putting Amazon S3 and you have um, unpredictable uh, uh, queries that you don't want to budget for upfront. You don't want to manage the infrastructure yourself, right? It's, it's easy to get started and run arbitrary queries, <laughs> and you don't have to worry about spinning up a cluster, managing a cluster. Uh, what we discovered with a number of customers is that if you run a lot of queries on Athena, eventually the cost of running that on Athena is larger than owning your own cluster and running Presto yourself. Uh, just because the pricing model is different for compute versus the, the query as a service model like here, right? So you have to pick, pick sort of uh, whatever is best for you. Uh, we typically advise people to compare Presto, whether that's for Starburst or not. To other options and 
see what's the, the best performance uh, and cost. They can pick the right choice. All right. Um, are there any uh, Athena users here in the room? Okay, there's there are a few. Okay, so we have more press users than Athena users. There's some different reason. <laughs> I would like to know if each of the collector in here will be joined, because I know Oracle with MySQL, okay, join. Mm -hmm. But each of one uh, I can uh, join? Yes. To open yes. to objects, Taylor? Yes. Uh, all the catalogs you configure in Presto are queryable as any, anything else. So, so yes. Yes, you can join five different tables and find five different data sources. So if I develop the Java API, it will be, be built in to join. Yes. Okay. So if you need to build a new connector from scratch because there's no existing one, uh, yes, you will deploy the cluster cluster and you can query your connector. They come in data coming from your connector with any anything else. And they can join. Yes. You can so join. Okay. Everything, everything. Yes. Who who carry the API or I need to take care of? It? Uh, you no. You, when you build a connector, you just expose. Um, there's like a set of APIs: um, metadata API, and data location API, and also data reader API. You implement those three APIs, and that's all Presto needs uh, from you to introspect the, the schema and how to schedule the query, and then how to actually fetch the data. And that's all you need. Well, thank you. No more question. Thank you. Amazon has recently announced public QA. Just have SQL for everything in the data, and then I'm going is it a competitive threat to Presto or it's a um, complementary? How will you assess this? Okay, yeah, good, good question. So I never used uh, this new packet QL, um, so I don't have hands on experience with it. Uh, from what I read, yes, it can query a number of different sources. I don't think it can query as many as Presto, and one part which I would have to ask someone from Amazon for, uh, for clarification, but I don't think this new tool uh, scales uh, to hundreds and thousands of nodes and can handle such a big load. I don't think it can do that, but we can maybe ask someone here. I honestly have never tried that tool. Um, <coughs> Alright, so let me move on. Um, so beyond the connectors that are already there, um, there's actually a number of other applications of Presto and people building new connectors every day. Right. Um, so Delta Lake, if you are a Spark user, you might be familiar with a company called Databricks that does uh, sort of a hosted version of, of uh, Spark in, 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 in various clouds, including Amazon. They invented something uh, called Delta, uh, which is essentially a parquet-based file format, table format, um, that enables uh, functionality like inserts, updates, deletes over parquet files without manually manipulating files. Um, uh, so you can think of Delta like kind of like um, it's it's more similar to you know traditional database in the sense that you can do updates, which is not true for sort of the classic uh, S3 uh, uh, storage, right? Um, uh, anyway, anyway, Presto can query that today. Um, and uh, there's Pulsar, which is a Apache project for, for both streaming analytics. Um, uh, Presto, they actually leverage the company behind the project uh, called Streamlil. They actually uh, leverage Presto as a SQL interface to that uh, engine. Um, Iceberg uh, is, is a, an, another parquet based uh, table format invented at Netflix, and they recently open sourced that. And, uh, Committed, uh, contributed back to Apache. Um, uh, Uber invented Kudi, which is another table format for uh, cases where you want to insert rapidly and also have high performance for analytics. Uh, uh, again, all of those formats work with Presto. Um, and there are two startups, TileDB and DugabyteDB, that are also leveraging Presto as a SQL interface for their customized storage and under the cover. Right? Uh, so they basically took Presto because it was a great SQL engine and they are building on top of um, that providing specialized uh, uh, storage uh, mechanisms. Um, uh, so those are some examples uh, which just shows flexibility of Presto. Um, 
Great. So you might be wondering who is using Presto. Uh, there's a bunch of people in the room. In the room. Uh, so maybe your company name is already on this uh, list. If not, uh, let me know. I can add your logo here. Uh, those are some of the examples. Now that it's not a comprehensive list. Uh, I know Wix is a big user of Presto here in Israel, um, but I'm sure there are other. The key point here is that um, Presto is used by a variety of different companies, uh, internet companies, uh, like large uh, traditional companies, uh, large enterprises, uh, the massive scale, different environments, different businesses, different use cases, different verticals. It's very, very broadly applicable to sort of its capabilities, um, and I'm sure it will work great for many other use cases, maybe the ones that you have uh, in mind. Uh, Great. So, um, you know, like, the other thing to consider is like, you know, like some of those guys uh, who are running Presto are doing this at a massive, massive scale, right? They're running thousands of nodes, like Uber, Lyft, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn, uh, and that scale uh, they're running at, you know, they're talking petabytes of data process daily, and hundreds of users and thousands and thousands of queries a day, just. Uh, Validates Presto as a technology. It's proven at scale. It's proven at high concurrency, uh, and and you know it's just probably let you sleep, sleep better because you know Netflix and others are running this at massive scale. Right? So you don't have to worry uh, with this new technology and work for me. Right? It's already proven. Uh, so I, I don't want to read all the details. I want to definitely show slides after the presentation, uh, but you, you can you can see the scale of Presto operates uh, today. Anybody's going to pick a class with that? Let me know. <laughs> Any questions here? Yeah. Just interesting observation with Facebook is all the money to climb the number of nodes. I mean, any reason for that? Yeah, there's a the reason. Of Facebook is bigger or different application? Uh, I, I would say Facebook, obviously, that's where the Presto was born. So they started using this uh, in early, early days, and they basically replaced a lot of legacy hive uh, use cases. Uh, so, it's basically it's everywhere. Uh, they're also one of the biggest companies in terms of their data size and, uh, and used to analyze. Uh, I would say Uber and Twitter are catching up pretty quickly. Um, they, they used to be just a couple of hundred, and now they are in the thousands, so you know, it's quite cool to see. There's a race. <laughs> so, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, can you talk a little bit about the difference between Presto and why do you choose which one? Uh, no. And and the second question I have is you're talking about they have first in production. We don't. Um, there are different kinds of production. So if I have I if I have um, a data that is uh, I have a, I have a schema everything, but I have lots of data. Can I? Can I have it in something that is really exposed to so click and have a look? Do they really use it to do analytics that it need to be presented to the user in this in 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 and in this second? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good question. So you can see from this picture that RC and PR are the most popular file formats in general, and that's also true for Presto. Um, the, the reason is that both our columns are compressed, uh, high efficiency formats. Uh, nobody invented anything better, uh, really, uh, so far in the sort of open source world, obviously. Um, the differences, um, like they are pretty much the same to me right now. I think the, in the early days, there were, there were some more significant differences, like RC uh, focused on less nest data, more compressed data, um, and it was more prevalent in, especially in the Hadoop world, uh, when you're, when Hotmart was a choice of the platform for Hadoop. Uh, Parquet grew up out of Twitter and, and with help from Cloudera and uh, the vendor. I think Twitter, Twitter had a use case around like very heavily nested data, and Parquet had features that supported that uh, very well. Um, so in the early days, those differences were more uh, pronounced. I think right now they're pretty much the same. And the difference is like, we run benchmarks with both, obviously, and we have customers using both. Um, and and like, the differences are like, you know, 
ten percent here and there, depending on the uses. And so um, I wouldn't really worry about this too much at this point. Uh, Presto, because uh, Facebook uses Presto uh, with ORC primarily, they don't use Parquet. Like the support for ORC is slightly better in Presto today. Again, maybe 10, 15, 20 percent uh, over Parquet. Um, but because of uh, many other contributors, Uber and Twitter um, and Lyft using Parquet, the support for Parquet in Presto is becoming really, really good right now. So you know, at some point, we just even out completely. That was the first question. Second question is um, uh, if someone's using BI tools and expect really interactive uh, queries, how fast you can get with Presto? Uh, so I would say a uh, reasonable expectation for Presto in BI analytics is that the queries you will be uh, second to three, three five, uh, depending on how much data you query, how complex is the, uh, the query, and what's the power of the Presto cluster, right? If you have 10 nodes and you try to query a petabyte, it's not going to be interactive just like in nature. Um, so, so you can go to about a second latency. Uh, if you want to go to 10 milliseconds, press is probably not the right tool for the job. It might still be okay to extract data with press to bring it to the as an export or something like that and keep it in memory locally. And do that fast that, that's, that's uh, I would say, the, the good sort of, uh, way to think about this. Any other question? And so, so uh, I'll just time away. <laughs> oh no, okay. <laughs> I have to keep, keep up the things. All right, cool. So uh, I have a bunch of slides. So I won't get to all of them. Um, so yeah, if you're not yet convinced why press is a good choice, and there are several pillars to, to that answer, I would say community-driven open source project. You saw big users of Presto that are on this massive scale. They are going. They invested uh, lots of effort into this project. You can be confident this will continue. Community contributes. It's, uh, it's uh, not driven by one company. It's not driven by a single commercial vendor or like many other projects. It's actually driven by uh, a large community, and we are one of the players. Um, uh, you know, it's high, high performance ANSI SQL engine. This is needed by almost any organization in the world. With the recent advancements, uh, as well as optimizer, um, uh, which I will discuss later in the presentation. Uh, you know, like Presto is, is kind of really a good, good choice for high performance um, SQL and complex SQL segments. Proven scale, we talked about this, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of nodes uh, at a large scale, high concurrency, right? So, so Presto, I mean, I agree, uh, Presto, designed all for Presto in the early days was high performance and also high concurrency, uh, which were exactly the things that high couldn't provide back then. And, um, so that's the that's in design from the one. Um, one sort of a side effect of the architecture is separation of compute and storage, right? So I mentioned around Presto independent of the storage, uh, which wasn't that much important to Facebook in the early days, but it just happened naturally because of other needs. Now that design point actually makes a lot of sense now in the cloud, right? Uh, more and more organizations are moving to the cloud, running fully in the cloud from the day one. Uh, storage is never local to your processing, and, and, and Presto is designed to leverage that efficiently because if you're running AWS clusters or any, any kind of cloud clusters, you'll pretty see that it's, uh, your, your AWS bill is proportional to a uh, number of compute hours. Most storage is so cheap that you don't even look at that uh, line item, but the, the, the compute hours on your instances is where you want to save money. Um, so running Presto clusters efficiently and scaling them up and down as needed is important. Uh, and shutting them down. Then, uh, yes. In case of small cluster, is it better to run the Presto on the work engine to so run that locality, or, or it's better to to run them on separate machine worker on an iPad out of the work of the spot? Yeah. So in most of the situations, you shouldn't assume or even target data locality uh, because it's much more efficient to keep data in a space. Uh, so fast um, that uh, keeping HDFS running locally or other stores running locally is typically just going to be more expensive um, and because you need to have storage. Um, you cannot easily shut down the cluster because you're losing data. So 
That's why, like, you know, and, and because of speed of network in, in today's data center, like the, 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 the cost of reading remotely, the data remotely, uh, is not that high anymore. It was a huge uh, design point for HDFS to be you know, data local. Now it's having uh, a wrong assumption because the metrics are so much faster than they used to be back in the day. So, yeah, the final uh, final pillar to, to Presto, which is uh, pretty amazing in my case, is uh, you know, it's no, there's no vendor login, right? It's an open source project, obviously. Uh, you are not dependent on the Hadoop distribution. Um, you know, like in the back in the day, there were three major distributions: Cortex, Cordera, and Mapper, each offering different SQL engines. You couldn't easily move from one to the other because it was a huge migration to your users, rewriting queries, and so on, and so on. Uh, or SQL on one platform, Parquet on the other. Uh, it was a mess. So, it first it gives you the freedom that you can actually move from from any Hadoop distribution. To another uh, without any, uh, any problem, because there are some all of them, and you're not bound to your storage engine. So you may pick today to run Presto over a data in HDFS, and uh, you know, next year you realize HDFS is no longer needed, I can move all my data to S3, whether that's on the cloud or a local um, uh, in the data center, there are S3 compatible data storage uh, engines, office storage uh, for your data center. You can do that, your users will not even notice uh, a difference. The, the queries are still working the same because they are talking to press the about the uh, storage. Uh, and you're not bound to, to your cloud vendor if you want to switch from the brand to the cloud or to a different cloud vendor. Uh, because again, press the runs on any cloud, on any environment, both on brand and, 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 and public cloud. So, those are my reasons why press them. Uh, I hope that's compelling. Cool. So, so a couple words. Uh, I promised to be brief about Starbucks and our enterprise edition. So, so we like to say that we are Presto experts. Um, uh, committers from Starbucks are the most active on the project, uh, in addition to, to the founders of Presto, obviously. Uh, at this point, we are we contributed about half of the code uh, to the open source project. Um, uh, over four years of contributions uh, in, in various areas. Um, uh, what we offer uh, commercially is access to our team. Um, we can we can support you in production of any issues. Uh, if you are subscribing to our services, uh, we will help you. Uh, you can run Presto anywhere on the cloud. We have uh, many customers globally. Uh, some of the big names from the slide uh, previously are our customers. Um, uh, On-prem, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, uh, and recently on Kubernetes, which we'll touch on uh, later as well. We have a number of extensions to Presto for that are important to enterprise users. Uh, things like integration of Security Ranger and Sentry, uh, commercial uh, connectors, Oracle Play, uh, uh, EQ, uh, or the EC driver to so your own sort of uh, classic VI tools work. So those are the excellent benefits uh, of our uh, distribution. You can also get our stuff for free from our website. It's a free download. You can use it as much as you want. Uh, uh, you can think of us kind of like a Caldera or Cornwall in the back in the day of the video free distribution. If you're, if you're feeling comfortable running this, uh, you can come to us for, for support, 24 by 7 support and extra features. Um, um, more details here. And if you want to work with a local company, obviously we have a big data with you. Um, Okay, so specifically for, for AWS, uh, and actually, how many of you run in AWS cloud? Okay, 20%. So, I think, I think you run, yeah, I figured you run. <laughs> how much of you have that All right, okay. So, so, we have a fully integrated offering on Amazon, obviously, <coughs> our first integration into the, uh, into the cloud was on AWS, obviously the largest uh, and most popular cloud. Um, uh, so we uh, obviously you can query all, all things uh, as free. We integrate with AWS Blue Catalog, so you know, press the whole talk to Blue Catalog for table definitions, or to high methods to run your EMR, uh, you can pick between those two, um, both equal and equally good. Um, 
Uh, we integrate uh, with CloudWatch, we publish our presser specific metrics to CloudWatch, uh, and then the dashboard and monitor it faster um, uh, in, in, this, um, in this tool. Uh, we integrate fully with auto scaling. Um, uh, so if you're running things on Amazon, might be familiar with auto scaling. Uh, this basically means that your clusters can, can grow and shrink uh, in response to the load on the system. So you don't have to manually provision more instances right? uh, if you want to save money. Uh, 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 on less busy time, right? um, and have more capacity than when there are lots of queries on the system, right? And you can enable this by schedule or um, or auto scaling uh, automatically as well. Uh, we develop a uh, high availability setup for coordinator in Presto, so so you never experience um, uh, downtime um, in Presto operations. Um, and it's all available <coughs> on AWS Marketplace, so you can go there, subscribe. It's a free trial. Um, you can run this for, for several days and get our experience of our software uh, without any commitment at all. Um, you can pay as you go, uh, or you can come for us for a longer term um, uh, subscription for one discount and makes less for them. What about other Amazon managed services like RDS or Elasticsearch? They all support this here. Y yes, yes. So, First, it's connected to all those things, right? So obviously, RDS could be Postgres, MySQL, Aurora, and so on. So Presto can configure uh, them as a data source for Presto. So Amazon S3 is just a default, or what? Yeah, well, most of the data, big data, sits in S3 uh, as in cloud, so it's not default. But yeah, all the connectors that I mentioned earlier, you can grind them. Oh, yeah, 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 not on top of So. Um, and recently, we introduced integration with Kubernetes, which again I will cover in more detail later. So, if you're running on AWS and want to leverage Kubernetes, uh, EKS is the solution over there. Uh, so, so uh, more details and a link to subscribe to the free trial is here under this URL. Um, um, and, and we, you know, like obviously, this is software, this is support. What if I need some consulting and help hands on here locally? That's where Big Data Boutique is, is here. Um, I can help uh, to get started and also offer training and, and other customizations for me. Um, and because there are experts in Elastic, um, they have plans to build a really powerful Elastic connector for the rest as well. So, talk uh, to them about this. Uh, uh, again, again uh, here's the link for more details. Um, um, so use cases. So uh, some of you run Presto already. Uh, what are the key use cases you're using Presto for? Well, query S3. Sorry? Query, query S3. S3, okay. All right. Typically, that's Full BI. Power BI? Uh, Full BI. That's okay. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, the two um, two major two or three major <coughs> use cases that I see like the classes of use cases but let's call them right. So one is basically some people run modern data warehouse on, on data lake, right? Meaning that um, you know in the back in the day they, they could be running uh, big boxes of I don't know Excel data or Teradata or some data legacy systems that were uh, very expensive, very powerful, and they deliver a lot of things. Um, uh, for the right price. Um, if you look into big data, where data is too big to store in one of those environments just because of uh, the cost uh, and, and sort of uh, inherent limitations, they are putting all the data into S3 or HDFS and big data stores, very expensive to store. However, they still need the data warehouse like capabilities, mostly for, for their own reporting uh, and, and sort of analytics um, uh, and, and just run SQL in general, right? So their choices is typically object storage, as we mentioned, sometimes it is best, but less and less these days uh, uh, because object storage can be actually on premises and in the cloud uh, as well. Uh, they are leveraging one of those ORC paper file formats, obviously with proper partitioning and, and so on and so on. Um, to get really good performance, and then they deploy Presto as compute only uh, SQL engine, right? So that's basically bread and butter, uh, classic use case for Presto, right? Um, and that's why you probably want to consider Presto um, in the first place. Um, uh, pretty obvious, uh, it's an alternative uh, to uh, to data warehouse, classic data warehouse, yes. Are you yourself a founder in terms of query and latency? Of, uh, 
impressed with how many people follow this. So the, so the question is whether the person is bounded by a screen? No. The latency is the situation where it is good. The question is if you are making a good experience by trying to use like Molder, like using for some of the partition in HTTPS, which mm -hmm. is like more speed than we're doing. Okay. 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 Something, and basically, we started using the, we are using the first of the time now, we started the, to run the first video on the email, and recently we went to first of SQL on the Kubernetes, and in general, we are really happy about it. And okay. Uh, our main use case, our main uh, issue with it is the, in, uh, the instability and uh, unpredictable. I marked over, mark over S3 with the same compute, the same amount of, uh, of workers, the same machines, and get different performance every time. So I mean, I'm bounded okay. by S3, but it's working uh, that front end all of us. Well, obviously, it's hard to, to answer without going into details, right? I would like to visit you guys and sit for an hour and then look at the codes and pop up and so on. I would love you to do that. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so um, yeah, unfortunately, my flight is soon after uh, the sync up, so I could run here. But, but uh, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, our friends in the bank can probably stop by and gather some details and you know, always set up a call and a lot of people. Um, I'm, Every day I'm, I'm living in Boston, so it's a bit far, but I can still make it and find an hour, you know, evening for me or morning for me, evening for you, and we'll figure out. Um, I can arrange the time. Don't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Look at the details uh, of that. So, um, okay, so the second use case that comes up sometimes, uh, which is, you know, like not every organization is ready to completely move to the new architecture and data lake. Like, uh, they still need traditional data warehouse. Some of the users are, you know, more comfortable with this tool. Um, whether that's again like uh, or technologies like this, uh, but because of the limitations of the platform, those platforms and cost, uh, they only they want to minimize the amount of data there um, and keep the, the really big data in inexpensive data lake. Like S3, for example. Right? So they keep only recent hot data in the traditional data warehouse, uh, move to older data, to the big data lake, um, and they leverage the transfer capability to run queries across many uh, data sources and present the data as if it was one virtual data set. Um, okay? So essentially, let's, let's say you have the, the last year of data. In, in your, uh, say, third data Oracle D2 platform, uh, and the rest of the history, the dependent rest of the data is sitting in S3 or H2 banks, right? Now, you want to calculate a number of transactions per country, right? Um, uh, across all entire data sets, even though it's split into places, right? So, what you can do in Presto, which is pretty amazing, is to completely hide the fact that you separate the data into two different stores. You can create a view uh, that will internally refer to those two catalogs registered in Presto separately. One, say, coming from Oracle, uh, and we only care about the most recent data since the beginning of this year, and then union this with all the data coming, say, from the list or S3, uh, that's older than that, right? Um, and to the end user, your analyst, you know, I'm not exposing those two uh, connectors at all, the only, you're only telling them there is an old transaction table, and they can issue any query they want um, uh, to, to learn more about the transactions. Uh, if you run this query, Presto will, first of all, handle the fact that they can split across. Um, it will execute subsets of this query locally on those, uh, you know, uh, fetch the relevant data from the data source to bring to Presto, compute the, the, uh, whatever application needed in this case, uh, present the result, right? No, no, no maintenance needed. You can still go to Oracle, say in this case directly, and query that for the most recent transactions, um, for the high, high performance legacy tools, whatever. But you can enable best analysts to to, to run across any data source. Um, yes. Uh, same related question. Um, would that might use case would that uh, uh, have uh, a I don't know how to correct me, but you can answer me. We have a big table. Which is very highly partitioned. We have partitions by day, by 
other specific content. And I was wondering if there's a limitation to um, the amount of provisions Presto can read without you know, reaching the bottleneck or something. Maybe it's preferable to, if you did it here, split it two different tables with up to, mm -hmm. let's say, for one year, one table, another, another table, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Are you, are you already experiencing the issue of those partitions? Or is, I'm working theory. I'm yeah. using our uh, ID Meta Store. And okay. That has a limitation of like 10,000 partitions, I think. At some point. Per table. Um, yeah. So I was like, wondering if this is a limitation that's also related to Presto. Or right. Or right. Or different okay. The, yeah, I understand the question. Right. So obviously, Hive Meta Store or, or Blue Catalog are not things that are internal to Presto or external, right? So if there is a limitation, like inherent limitation in those uh, systems, that will, to some extent, affect Presto as well. My right. question is, oh, yeah. I, if I decide to, to say move from Presto to that Delta way, that is would there still be an issue in the Presto engine, or is it something that's you stay with? Or there's no issue in Presto in terms of how many positions you need. Yeah, right, right. So, so you're talking like potentially migrate from yeah. regular S3 or C or whatever to some Delta or like, some other storage, right? Yeah. So I would say, first of all, like. There is potentially an inherent limitation, but I think Presto is much less likely to fit that limitation. And the reason is that unlike Hive and Spark and other engines, uh, Presto is not enumerating all the partitions up front um, during the query and execution. It's actually sort of discovering those partitions and scanning files uh, sort of on the fly, uh, more sort of in a more graceful manner. Uh, so we, often we don't hit the same problems. Uh, those other tools, right? Um, I would say Metastore has their own issues, um, and everybody who answers here knows that. Um, I think some users are experimenting with Glue, uh, you know, but some, some of them are happy, some of them are discovering new limitations. Uh, uh, the answer to some of the limitations of Metastore is to use one of those modern to, uh, storage and table formats such as. Delta Lake or Iceberg. The, the reason Iceberg was developed by Netflix and Delta was developed by Bitterbricks uh, was to handle some of the limitations of the Meta Store and some of the limitations of the actual storage and capabilities. Um, so they both handle many partitions uh, much better than the Meta Store. They, they have a hook to Meta Store to appear in Meta Store that the tool like Spark or Presto will. Read the table definition from there, but the actual partition management and so on is done uh, in their own manner, which is already ready for the scale they're, they're running at uh, today. And yeah, the methods is pretty big, so hopefully they solve this problem sufficiently well. So, yeah. Uh, okay, great question. Um, so, that was one example, um, uh, uh, you know, the extending the traditional data warehouse. The, the last one is, is sort of the, the federation uh, of the data sources, right? So some of you mentioned you got multiple different data sources. Uh, in this case, we can leverage several data sources, but the actual data in them is sort of logically different, right? Unlike in the previous example where it was one logical table. In this case, those are two separate uh, tables and different data sources. One example from, from our customer um, back in the US is, uh, large cable company running uh, legacy systems, data warehouse system, building data stored there, all the customers there, uh, and all the bills are there. However, the viewing data uh, like actually shows you watching uh, on cable and things you're watching on the internet. Uh, they saw all this information in the data store, right? Yes. And they choose obviously data like this the best other than, um, uh, than data warehouse because of the massive scale, right? However, very often they are looking for analytics that spans those two data sets. Uh, in this case, they uh, are trying to identify certain subsets of users, customers, uh, uh, based on the viewing behavior, uh, and maybe offer them a better uh, you know, cable plan, right? Or, um, or maybe they're watching, they're seeing that you're not watching any shows, and you're at risk of unsubscribing, so they may send some special promotions. Or, ideas what to watch, whatever, they can do all the smart analytics and suggestions, recommendations, right? Uh, two different data sets, they want to join them together, they don't want to load one data to, to the other platform, it's sort of ETL work, uh, you know, skip that, so they are looking into identifying 
100 heavy uh, movie watchers in 2018 and the current plans they are, they are subscribing to. Uh, and they can just do that simply with Presto by joining with the sources um, together. Uh, again, join on a condition. You, you need to find a key on which to join, obviously. So uh, in this case, they have customer ID on both data sets and they can just apply the regular SQL, right? So as you can see, where, whenever data is, it's a one SQL them and you can do whatever you want with this. So drawing, segregations, and rendering functions, whatever you want, and then find what you want. Okay. Um, right. Yes. So, again, uh, regarding this question, one of, we, we tried to do this on Hadoop slash Cassandra, and we, one of the issues we had was, as far as I understand, press does a join on memory, right? And the problem, so my question is if I give this like a uh, specific filter, would it do the push and filter on both tables before you did the join? Or would it have to like give hundreds of gigabytes of memory? Yeah, okay, perfect question. Um, so, so Presto is, I would say, optimized for running in memory. Um, that's where it can do a really fast performance. There's actually a capability right now that was developed by a team about two years ago, which is called Still to Disk, which you can enable and that will. Uh, allow Presto to use this as an extension of memory when the data intermediate results of join. Uh, this is on Presto memory. SQL, right? Like, on the it's, new community um, Presto. Yeah, it's in, yeah, the control well back, obviously. Yes, yes. Um, so, so it's, it's there. Um, I would say the experience of running on this based configuration like this, well, the cruise won't be interact anymore, right? So you have to assume that, unfortunately. Yeah. And the only way to, to uh, ensure that. Uh, fast performance would be to increase the cluster size if possible, right? Because then you can keep running this query in memory. However, scale down or scale up, like scale, scale memory. You can you can do both, right? So both. Like adding more workers would solve the issue. Yes, yes. No, no. Uh, it will solve the problem because Presto paralyzes all the operations across all the nodes in the cluster, um, which means uh, you really want to. You care about the aggregated memory of an entire cluster for operations like joins and, and others, right? But uh, to, to also uh, answer your other question, yes, those predicates uh, that are like, simple enough to push down to, to the underlying data sources uh, are always pushed down. So, first of all, Presto would only bring columns that actually needs from data sources, right? You might have 100 columns uh, in your table, Presto would bring only two if that's what you're asking in your query, right? So, that's one thing. And it will also push down any simple predicates like this, you know. In this case, we are only interested in, in, in a certain period of time. Uh, we'll push this down. In this case, this is uh, W, so it's coming from uh, from Hadoop, right? Or S3, in this case, sorry. Um, so, yes, this predicate will be okay. pushed down. Uh, addition, like up, down, yes. the scale the unnecessary. Yeah, so there are two levels, right? We can do partition only uh, based on the predicates. If you are actually using a uh, partition key as, as one of the filters, we'll push that down and enumerate the only partitions we need. Um, and the second thing, even with uh, additional predicates that are not on the partition key um, and also the additional filters, uh, Presto is smart enough to leverage the parquet or CMIP that is skipping data when it's opened the file. Um, it comes with the, the footer, it knows that you may have certain uh, stripes and blocks within and skip unnecessary bytes from consideration here as well. Right? So the, the number of bytes coming out of storage to press this is minimized uh, as much as possible. If the underlying <coughs> engine, in this case, says SQL Server, let's assume there is another predicate on the customer, but we're only making customers to take in one state other than by the world. Uh, and the predicate exists in the SQL clause here, um, we'll push that down to uh, the database as well, right? So the SQL server in this case will pre filter routes coming uh, to Presto uh, using that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so those are my use cases. Yes. Is there some kind of preparation of the data before you query it? Let's say you, you, one of the resources is Kafka. So is there some kind of uh, reprocessing or preparation in order for you to query that? Uh, or only when a trigger the SQL query, he handles the topic or whatever, starts to read from offset zero, how does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there are two things. So there's no 
you don't have to prepare your data in a data source, right? You'll be reading as it exists in a data source using the proper mapping uh, table. The connector code, which is a piece of code that you, know, you develop or you took from, from the Presto, which is sitting on the Presto nodes, will do the transformation, like the conversion from underlying representation to some binary representation arbitrary into Presto internal representation that allows us so each and every time. Sorry? So each and every time it will be done again, again, again? In this, yeah. So Presto is meant to query data where it lives, right? Um, so it will, for well, every time you should query, it will contact a data source for the latest uh, state of that data, um, bring the relevant pieces for that query and, and process it. So let's say, let's say one of the resources is Kafka. Each and every time I will read the entire topic to prepare the data for the SQL query. Is right. that correct? Is that correct? Because uh, between a query number one or a query number two, the content of the topic may change, right? right? We don't control that. So so we have to assume that data has changed and we bring that fresh. Okay. Right. If you if you feel like um, there is an overhead in the Kafka or you can actually freeze the state of the data and you want to do some analytics over that, um, you can always um, bring the data from Kafka in Presto, uh, insert that into a temporary table, say in Parquet, do analytics on that, which will be faster than bringing this from Kafka every time, obviously, okay. um, and, and then discard that temporary table after that. So that's an option to Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, this is section now. All right, we're doing some time, okay. Um, so, a section on performance. Um, <coughs> I would say Presto was built for performance from the day one. Uh, you know, it's MPP, we were attacked from this, uh, process data in memory as much as possible to be fast, uh, pipelines data between stages to sort of minimize um, any latency, uses columnar and virtualized data processing. So it fetches data from, from the storage. Internally, Presto represents it in, in a form of column and vectors uh, when it's trying to do the operations then. So, the most efficient techniques that are currently available, uh, Presto has that built in from the day one. It compiles the code into bytecode, byte which makes it a bit more efficient in interpreting uh, SQL each time, um, and uses up very optimized data um, structures in memory. Uh, and that, combined with the multi threaded and multi core uh, execution, uh, Presto is able to leverage for modern hardware, whether that's cloud or on prem. That's a great foundation, uh, I would say. Now, if you use our CPK, then, then you get columnar benefits on the storage level. Uh, again, uh, great performance boost. We've already got a column prediction push down, which uh, you already asked for, so, so you don't have to explain them anymore. Uh, you know, this is a great package to do a very efficient SQL analytics across the main data sources. However, one piece that was missing until recently was cost based optimizer. Um, how many of you know anything about cost based optimizers? Okay. You. All right. So, if you're coming from, from traditional databases, you probably know that it's, it's good to have statistics on your data and, and, and Postgres and other databases you know, are proud to produce really efficient query plans. Um, why do you need that? Well, if you are typing a query that's doing 10 joins or maybe even 5 joins in your SQL statement, Doing them in a fashion one by one, as uh, sort of, uh, specified by the end user, is not all, always sufficient. It actually may not actually matter. Uh, SQL is a declarative language, right? The end user should not care uh, in which order tables are mentioned in a SQL statement, right? Sometimes you don't have control over that because it's coming from a BI tool and you don't know how the SQL is constructed, right? So you want the optimizer to do this uh, for you, and that's what every data warehouse in the world does. Uh, Presto does that too today after our contributions. So, so we built um, Postgres optimizer uh, and delivered that last year. We're leveraging things like uh, statistics. It's coming from Python to store. Uh, we're doing join reordering uh, to basically come up with the best plan possible. Uh, we automatically pick the joint strategy for you. So in Presto, you have joints that are like broadcast joints or partition joints. Uh, you know, manually it's really hard to control which one to uh, run. Now uh, we can do that automatically for you based on the, uh, our predictions, um, and and then pick which joints to be on the left and the right side, and so on, so on. All of this together, again, lots of details on our blog uh, here. Um, uh, I will only just give you some highlights. Um, 
and very interesting. Um, so we leveraged those stats and the meta store, uh, number of rows, number of missing values for columns, uh, number of nulls, mixed and minimized nice value, and so on. So on all of that, uh, we used to model uh, cost of the query using CPU memory and network uh, estimates, right? And we consider several variants of the query um, a plan before choosing the one that that's we believe is going to be most efficient um, before running the query, and then we actually spend the query. Um, so some examples, just visually, right? So if you join a large table and a small table, uh, you know that we could reshuffle both of them over the network, but that's going to cost you more time, use more resources. So if we have enough information about the fact that this table is actually small. Uh, enough, or we can change it to broadcast and then we send the small table around and make join local to the bigger to the chance of the bigger table and avoid, we avoid shipping the, the large table around uh, because the, the join can happen locally and then we can just do that uh, more efficiently. Um, yes. Uh, does the optimizer also take into account the uh, push down uh, uh, So it knows. Not just the table itself. <coughs> yeah. So, so we estimate uh, two things like, uh, well, first of all, if you prune partitions, we adjust the stats based on that as well. And because you're filling some uh, rows to the predicates, that changes our estimates about how they move to. So that's accounted. I think I even have an example here. Uh, <laughs> this. Uh, so, so just, just let's go over this quickly. Uh, uh, so, saying you have no predicates on your, your query, the natural way to do your join is to join just two smaller, smaller tables, uh, custom and older in this case, and then to do an item at the end, uh, because it's the largest, you don't want to carry the millions of rows over the network many times. However, that approach is only great uh, for some time until you introduce query clauses, uh, like in this case, right? So, if you do that, um, and you have a filter on a column item uh, from this table, suddenly, if this is a very selective filter, this table is not going to be that large anymore, the first stuff, because we've pushed this down, pushed this filter down, uh, we do this at the scan level, what's coming out of this is only 3,000 rows, which is way smaller than anything else, so we should be actually doing this, uh, this sort of intermediate relation uh, first, with the table that we can join with this, which is orders, uh, and then the customer last in this case, right? And as you notice, you know our estimates for the intermediate data was like this uh, in this shape. However, after this, we know we can cut the estimated number of intermediate rows to three thousand because this is the relation that's sort of governing the cardinality of all uh, relations that are on the sort of primary key side of the. So, so we do all these smart calculations and we pick the right plan for you. Um, so you have to worry about this. All you have to do is to compute stats on your table um, uh, before we do that. Otherwise, we'll be fine. Um, all right, so the net effect of those optimizations, we have lots of benchmarks. Uh, and you can see how PESTA performed before and after introducing the optimizer. Uh, and you know the, the, the performance gains are sometimes super impressive if you to uh, 14 times in this case um, um, you know, for a subset of, of, uh, of really complex queries. So some of those are, are you know, 14, 15, 20 joins. Um, uh, you can't optimize this manually if you need to try very hard or you will spend days, which is quite necessary, obviously. Lots of details, uh, again, on the, on the benchmark. Um, my understanding is the CPO thing is part of the commercial offering, not the creation part of So my team uh, has built all this. Um, uh, it took us quite some time, I would say over a year. Um, we released that to our customers back um, in April last year. Um, and then we started contributing it back to the community. Uh, so by September, I believe, uh, all, that, all those benefits are contributed back uh, to press them for everyone to enjoy. We obviously continue to improve that, so we still get some improvements in our distribution, but because we are top committers to the project, we, we, we care about this, which has been in the current available for, for everyone. Um, 
Again, we run another benchmark with Simon in the cloud. For, you know, uh, some interesting observations. We were not able to run all the queries in the cloud so on the set on the fixed size of the cluster. It was just not enough memory on this cluster. So half of the queries from this benchmark failed. Um, when we enabled optimizer, optimizer was able to pick better plans, which enabled more queries to pass. Um, right. So that's the first benefit. And another benefit was that uh, on average uh, the speed improvement was seven x. Um, um, and one reason uh, now I recall why Athena was slower in some of the benchmarks. So Athena does not have optimizer enabled because they are relying on the version of Presto. So the trade also of running let let this Presto um, versus um, managed service as well. Um, Great, and um, since that uh, time I mentioned last year, we will also continue to improve Presto Optimizer, but also for more uh, advanced sort of rewrites and estimations, semi joins, uh, um, and you know, we introduced things like analyze table in Presto, so you don't have to go to other tools to gather stats for your big data, and it's free. You can do that from, from Presto directly. And also, we started supporting that's actually Starburst exclusive in our AWS offering. We can support uh, statistics in Blue Catalog, which natively doesn't support them for, for the data industry. So, if you do leverage the AWS Blue and Starburst, then you can leverage Optimizer better because Blue doesn't have stats, um, unfortunately. Um, and the last addition, quite recently, this earlier uh, this year, is we enable now CDO across all the data sources. Uh, of this, some of them. So, connect tools, oracles, for server, Postgres, and so on. We are actually able to leverage the statistics that they collected uh, internally and we <coughs> ask them, they, 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 they respond back. And we use that uh, to you know, make sure the joints between different data sources are now uh, more efficient than, than before. Right? Um, so, lots of work there. Um, uh, and some people obviously ask about possible benchmarks. Um, uh, we, I, I personally don't like to run benchmarks against other uh, technologies because I'm always biased, right? But uh, fortunately, Presto is so popular that you can find people running benchmarks with Presto online, uh, being completely independent, that do, do not work for any vendor uh, of the solution, so they compare Presto to, to things like Spark or Hive or I don't know, Redshift, Snowflake, um, anything on the planet, right? So you can read some of those benchmarks and results um, online as well. Um, great. Okay, so Kubernetes. Uh, I know many of you came here because I advise Kubernetes. Uh, how many of you are used to this like Kubernetes? Walker? All right, cool. All right, perfect. So Presto, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, Presto can be run anywhere, which is great, right? However, there are challenges running like Presto and anything else in the planet, right? Which is, uh, which is something we would like to tackle uh, efficiently, right? So in Presto case, right, just a very quick review, Presto has uh, one coordinator machine plus a standby uh, spare coordinators in a chain setup, and then a bunch of workers, right? But it could be physical workers, very much like VM, uh, whether it's cloud or on-prem, and you can even scale it as an up and down, right? So that's your compute layer. That's a storage layer, um, all different data sources, uh, object storage, whether it's cloud or on-prem, right? and your tools, right? So that's an architecture. Now, the challenge is running uh, Presto cluster. Why? Because there's a challenge running any cluster, right? If you have more than a couple nodes, like you cannot afford to log into each node and other configuration manually. It's, it's hard to do this efficiently, um, and it seems to make mistakes, right? So you need tools that Manage configuration scale, especially if you have hundreds of nodes, right? Or even tens of nodes, certainly manageable. Uh, you need tools to configure and manage the clusters easily. You want to auto tune properties of your system to the hardware on which you're running. Say, today you'll be using uh, R4 for a large instance, maybe tomorrow you switch to uh, C5, uh, you know, 18x large, right? The like, Presto settings need to be adjusted. But how do you know, you know? That you could someone change the classes uh, hardware right the, uh, underneath you, right? So we do that automatically. Um, um, and again, HA, HA, you know, like some people really want to have a cluster stable. If machine goes down, uh, it's self healing, right? You provision the coordinator, it's taking over, responsibilities, clients are not affected. Uh, 
very important for any production workloads. Uh, scaling cluster elastically based on query load, again, discusses how we can increase that based on, uh, on, on your uh, query load or schedule or, or whatever. Um, instrumenting all of this manually is a lot of work. Uh, uh, if you are removing workers from your uh, cluster because you don't need them, uh, however, you don't want to kill all the queries that are found in the cluster. Um, lots of lots of challenges and just monitoring hardware and software layers as a DevOps person or ops uh, in this case, right? Like you, you want to have visibility of what's going on in the cluster to troubleshoot any issues and, and react to them, right? So all of those things are just hard to do and we felt like it's really hard for us to do it all over for each environment every time. Um, however, um, there is something like Kubernetes, right? And it's becoming really popular both in the clouds and outside of the clouds, so it can run on premises too. Uh, and we basically put a bet uh, on instrumenting all those uh, capabilities uh, on top of Kubernetes. Um, and we are diving into some of the details on our blog recently, uh, but I would just, uh, given that you know about Kubernetes, I, I'm debating whether I can use it or not. But you can think of Kubernetes in general uh, and, and, and sort of. Uh, as an alternative to traditional, traditional deployments where there's bare metal and you're running on bare metal, right? Uh, is all ahead of doing this. Well, you're close to the bare metal. On the other hand, doing any changes is hard. Um, so people introduce virtualized, machi virtualized machines uh, to sort of hand isolate them from the actual hardware a little bit. So you can provide images and you can spin them up on any infrastructure without knowing uh, about the, the sort of nitty gritty details of the setup of OS here on the host. That was an improvement. However, uh, it, was, it wasn't portable and as extensible and flexible as, uh, as um, what came next, which is uh, Docker and Google Kubernetes, right? So, so now we are moving this away from a heavyweight virtual machine, which needs to have OS installed on top of them and so on and so on, into more lightweight containers that can run. Uh, directly over uh, over holes and with less over less overhead and maintenance, right? And they're much faster to spin up and uh, and so on, right? So with that, uh, you know, Kubernetes is really uh, just to think about clusters, clusters uh, of machines, right? The physical machines are there, obviously. Uh, however, you won't be interacting with the hardware anymore. Uh, it would be much easier for you to just deploy into the Kubernetes framework. Using their uh, principles, uh, uh, the key thing in, in Kubernetes is pod, right? Pod is the sort of equivalent of a, of a machine, a worker machine, right? Uh, on, on each pod, you can run multiple containers. However, in the Presto case, specifically because the Presto likes to sort of have exclusive access to resources, right? Doesn't like to compete with like, other engines, right? You would probably want to dedicate an uh, entire uh, pod to, to a Presto container. In this case, Presto container will be like a worker or coordinator, essentially, right? So, so rather use simple mapping. Um, um, and this is how we did it. So we leveraged a um, framework called uh, Kubernetes Operator, uh, where you can write a recipe uh, how, to, how the cluster should look like. Um, uh, that will essentially instrument the deployment, right? And it will provision a pod on which Presto coordinator runs, right? The brain of the system. It will provision a bunch of pods for workers over there, right? Um, and we can also provision a pod with Hive Metastore for you, so you don't have to manage your Hive Metastore anymore. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you have to do that, we will sort of integrate with horizontal pod autoscaler, uh, which is uh, uh, allowing us to leverage all the scaling in the Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, in the cloud, it's kind of obvious there's all the scaling, but in other environments, it's less so. We can instrument that uh, and set thresholds where to spin up, spin down. Um, we will distribute the configuration automatically to an to entire cluster so we can connect to your, your data sources um, <coughs> and, and expose that. Um, to analysts uh, via you know, some address or, or URL they can hit uh, and send queries. To, right? uh, all of this is running on Kubernetes engine with integration in, with Prometheus, so, so you can expose personal metrics to the monitoring service that's coming um, with Kubernetes uh, uh, by default. Right? So we've tested this already with uh, 
in on-premises environment, we write that OpenShift being the most popular, um, and all do cloud, all in all clouds, including Google Cloud, Azure Cloud, and Amazon. Uh, the amazing thing was that in in general, this works exactly the same in any environment, right? And there are some differences between different Kubernetes operators and and Kubernetes so frameworks. Uh, However, majority of the function is the same, and by doing this this way, we are now able offer to offer to presto in, in a much nicer package, easier to manage, deploy, and monitor. And if you move from one environment to the other, you're not uh, that big, so you're not looking in that environment differently. You look pretty much the same on any um, environment. Um, again, this is available for for a free trial. Um, you know, this is the link to the documentation and describes how to download the packages, you know, like we published all, all our um, uh, configuration files, you can start playing with this uh, and let us know. Yes. If you don't, beyond shipping and being lightweight, is there another advantage of uh, connecting with your multiple data sources? So would you go for Kubernetes if you don't, if you want to think about shipping and uh, neutralization? J just for connecting to various uh, Sure. Okay. Well, so, so I guess there are two separate values, right? So, there's Presto is a bit to be deployed anywhere, also Kubernetes, but you can also deploy it on bare metal, virtual machines, or whatever you want, right? So, like we provide automation template, the name I, so that was on uh, more native integration, right? Um, and so, that's one concern how you deploy Presto. Itself, right? Another concern is a bit connecting in data sources. And those are independent concerns, right? Is you, they are not strictly related to each other, right? You can run this in any way you want, uh, uh, even on your laptop, and, and still connect to data sources you want, uh, or probably not. Right? So there would be an, an advantage of using Kubernetes. Um, yeah. So advantage of using Kubernetes in general is is you know exactly those those reasons. That, I mentioned earlier, um, sorry, um, you know, like management of the cluster, it's a big cluster, it's a pain to manage that, monitoring and, and sort of integration of elastic uh, scaling and, and other things. It's all about like being ready for production um, in an environment that you holistically make sure that this is a mission critical system. You cannot go down, be offline, unavailable, and, and misconfigured, and so on. So those are the reasons why why you want something like Kubernetes because that abstracts you away from from so the, these problems. And even if you choose to migrate off, so we have all those features uh, already in natively on AWS because that's where we were since uh, day one. Um, however, if you want to offer that on other platforms. It would be a pain to rebuild this from scratch. So instead, we chose to rely on Kubernetes to provide us enough abstraction uh, from from the environment on which we run and still deliver the same functionality. Um, so that there's no trade off. Yes. What would be involved in getting it in a completely serverless environment like Fabit? Any essential component? Not Kubernetes, how it completely serverless and then is it possible? Um, yeah, so it will be another, it will be a different uh, integration, I would say. I'm not familiar with this environment to speak about uh, nuances, but it will be a different integration. Uh, I would say Presto, so the, the easiest way to think about Presto is it's basically a, you know, like a piece of software that can be a bunch of containers, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. So we distribute Presto in many different ways. This is one of many ways we distribute Presto. We can give you an RPM or a tarball software, and you can deploy it anywhere you want. Uh, as we discussed, you can integrate it with another container, container or orchestration system, or you can deploy it using um, Terraform, Chef, uh, whatever tool on your cluster. Right? Just, are there any heavy dependencies on local, local disk? No, not really. Not at all. Presto really needs, um, there needs there's some disk needed for configuration files, for log files, for data sitting somewhere else. So, so there's no dependency on local storage. 
Uh, the remind if you enable school to this uh, in some environments, then the nodes some local scratch space, but it's, it's never going to be lots of storage. Uh, in Cool. Yes. Uh, what are the advantages of using the operator inside the picture? What's the advantage? Um, Why should I use it? Um, I, I, think it's just, I think this is the, the, the new recommended way um, to describe your service in Kubernetes, where essentially, um, well, yeah, I guess you can click on this link. Uh, so basically, it's like, that's a recipe for my cluster. Okay. It specifies in, in, a, in a YAML file like exactly what the cluster needs to look like, how many nodes, how many resources it needs, what needs to be provisioned where, and so on and so on. And operator is essentially the mechanism within the Kubernetes framework to take that recipe and, and provision all those pods according to your recipe. Right? So you don't have to sort of think about oh, how do I distribute this RPM, how do I send the configuration file around. The uh, operator framework uh, is coming with the Kubernetes engine will work with the operating system. When you say, yeah, uh, it's a uh, what do you mean by uh, what the, like, uh, I think now the configuration running? Yeah, uh, you can, you can, if you go to this, you can deploy, you can do the scripts, you can publish to deploy it. It's a free trial in the sense that uh, uh, I think there are some limits on like, how big nodes you can run, and there's some limit around all the scaling. Uh, you consider them sort of the, the features that are worth paying for. Okay. If I'm like online, I'm like, I'm just taking the configs, so I can do whatever I want. That yes. Mean, like, yes. So like, yes. Uh, if I'm not running on like platform, and I just I That's, don't feel yes. Like, uh, yes. 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 No. For I sure. Have no yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I think the limitations uh, that I guess would be important are if you run, if you want to run this large scale uh, production environment, you know, like you probably want our support and services, updates, patches, and and so on, so on. Right? But super, you know, we can issue we can issue a free trial license if you want to run. Leverage all the capabilities uh, for, for some time, or you can run this more limited version for free on higher. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we are trying to be, um, you know, our business is around more open core, right? So the majority of the request is open source. We are any country to open source, we're giving this away for free. However, there's always something you have to say to run the business. Uh, yeah. That's what we do, right? We're great to do. <laughs> yes, other questions? Right. So, oh, this is great, and you can follow the example here. And uh, what we are planning to to improve further is uh, provide even nicer UI. And we already have um, something called mission control today, and uh, can spin up uh, presto clusters. Uh, and there are two two ways to, to do this. We can do this natively on the AWS using CFD and AMIs. And we have a version for Kubernetes as well. And we are also in, constantly improving that. That will allow you to specify your connectors and platform details in a simple UI uh, tool, uh, so you don't have to specify scripts anymore. Um, uh, if you have a UI um, sort of friendly uh, team, and you can do all this across all the environments as well. So this is sort of the, the tool that we recommend uh, going forward for anybody who wants to do this uh, in, uh, in a UI fashion. So that's that's that. For the presentation, uh, you can open the door for additional questions. Um, and also, if we have time, which I'd like to do a check, okay, uh, we can do a super quick demo of mission control and, and how, how press it works if, if you are interested. Okay, sounds good. Right. Yes, question. Could you talk a little bit about the rest of functions? Can you use the five functions? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so Presto is extensible. I, I, I forgot to add a slide about this. Uh, so Presto is extensible. Um, it has uh, a UDF uh, uh, and another difference versus Safina, actually, right? Safina would not let you do it for your own UDFs. Uh, if you run your own Presto, you can, you can do that. Um, so there's a simple API that follows Java and implements a set of 
APIs, uh, it requires the jar, deploy on the cluster, cluster, and now you have additional secure financials available for you. So what does it mean deploy on the cluster cluster? Yeah. Like Docker container or? Oh, in a, in a sense that you, you, what you produce, your UDFs will be compiled into a jar, right? That jar needs to be copied to the personal machine so that when the personal starts up, it knows about those kinds of functions to develop and, and allows them to be used during your queries. So, I mean, just copying the file and being on that every machine. Another yeah, question. Yeah. Has anybody tried to compile, for instance, in Graal VM to get native code? Uh, not aware of that. Uh, yeah, Java, Java plus Bytecode compilation we do at query time is getting pretty good results, so nobody really cared that much. Yeah, okay, so so mission control, I uh, mentioned that it's uh, our simple uh, management console, web UI. Uh, it allows you to specify data sources um, uh, that you would like to expose uh, in, in your cluster cluster or clusters. Uh, so, so in this case, I already have provision Google catalog uh, with some data in S3 and some data in RDS database clusters. In this case, um, you can add more connectors to the computer. Uh, you have more data sources available in your infrastructure. Um, so, some of those connectors. Uh, I don't think we have all the all of those items here, but um, uh, you know, you can pick uh, additional connectors um, from the list um, if you want. Um, so those will be your data sources. All of these configuration, configuration files under the, uh, you know, the delay is configuration file, but we save it in, in sort of uh, an RDS database so that you don't know, type them again and again. You don't have to worry about modifying them manually. You don't do all of this UI. Um, uh, and now you can define your cluster. So in this case, I have a one cluster provision already signed for some time. As you can see, I can obviously stop and, and start uh, as needed. I can go ahead and copy the definition of that cluster to have another cluster that I can then customize. Um, and you know, like in, a, in a typical organization, uh, you know, they, there are multiple clusters because there are potentially multiple groups doing different things with Presto. You don't want all of them to run against one cluster and compete for resources and so on. So you might be provisioning several clusters for different, different for reporting, different for uh, you know, data science and ETL and whatever. Um, so I can obviously add additional kind of classes from scratch. Um, so let's quickly look at this. So this is essentially the view for administrator, right, of, of the system, right? So we find uh, data sources for that specific cluster. Say maybe this is a cluster for people who should not have access to my finance data coming from Postgres. They only have access to S3. So I only select blue uh, as a, a catalog that's um, registered. I can define uh, first configuration. Uh, in this case, I can choose the instance type, you know, whether that's uh, R4, M5, and so on. Um, I can pick that. I can customize first configs uh, to the extent. Um, by default, first is pre configured and it's running very well, but you know, sometimes there are some special needs, so you're allowed to customize this configuration. Uh, I can pick additional instance type here for workers. I might be set a different coordinator. Uh, how many nodes you want uh, in your cluster, and so on and so on. Um, uh, at the end, you have additional things such as uh, a script, uh, which will allow you to customize your lighting and the image. Uh, you can deploy additional software or, or jars to develop your UDFs um, automatically. Um, you can enable HA uh, support for Superset, which is uh, open source critical, and, and so on and so on. Right? So, we can do lots of customizations here, and then also define your network you set up, um, and uh, also additional EC2 configuration. Right? Um, that's, that's sort of a quick, uh, quick overview of, of, uh, of the emission control. Once you have a cluster up and running, like in my case, um, uh, you, you have uh, a management console, which is native to the Presto project, um, uh, allows you to see and monitor how the cluster know how many queries you have running on the system currently, uh, how many are they waiting for. Make you, uh, what's this, uh, 
overall metrics to, to performance of the cluster, and you can see the history of your queries um, being run. So, you know, this is probably a good view for your DBA, right? Someone who's monitoring the, the health of the cluster um, and can react to the user requests, uh, why we want to install, and so on, because uh, you can always go here and click on the details of the query uh, and introspect what was going on, uh, how much time it took. Uh, uh, how much memory, how much CPU press to spend this, how many rows were read, and, and so on. So, lots of information, so internal information um, to the back performance of the query. Um, you can see, uh, first of all, which you can see original query, uh, how many stages of the processing were uh, involved uh, for the particular uh, query, and uh, you know, even down to the level of each node doing uh, uh, you know, processing, how many rows, how many bytes. How many euros per second uh, will process and plus the same shape, right? Uh, so, so, this is a great, great uh, interface for your for DBA uh, tool. And then, uh, you know, after that, there's your users, right? And they might be using Tableau or other SQL tools. Uh, super simple, and we bundle as a you know, quick starter for SQL editor. Uh, you know, you can refer to, to different tables, hang from different data sources. And, you know, like run the query, get a quick result. Uh, uh, you can even, I think, you can also, you can also run some data and present them in, in, in a chart format as well. Um, so, so you can sort of quickly visualize. It. So, I'm not uh, saying it's the best tool in the world, but it's a free open source tool that was developed by Airbnb, uh, open source into a Apache project, and you can serve basic uh, auto needs. Um, uh, in both in a visual and actual manner. Um, so those are three different views that I think is very important. You know, end user, operator of the cluster, monitor, DBA, and uh, actual management. And all those things are bounded, uh, bounded, in, in, bounded into uh, service of offering uh, both in, in the AWS uh, as well as on Kubernetes. Um, so you get this so cookie out of the box, so simplifying the operations. Um, all right, so that's a good demo. Uh, and the rest of the time is for questions. Uh, yes? Is, is it possible to instantiate uh, rest of uh, Amazon uh, spot instances? Yes, yeah, so we do have that capability. Uh, I kind of lost over that when you create a cluster in a first configuration at the end. Um, can specify spot instances uh, and define the price. So, so you can definitely have first the spots, uh, but they happen that they may go away and if we start a query sometimes. Uh, but you, you might be setting my name on the way. It's my thing, it's uh, the, the Starbucks as a service on cloud. Do you have anything, I don't know, a distribution for on prem? Uh, yes, yes. So, so this demo is obviously in a cloud. It's nice package. It's, um, it's first as a service. Uh, however, it does run in your infrastructure. <coughs> it's not hosted by us. Uh, your data and your infrastructure belongs to you. Um, with Kubernetes, you can deploy this on premises easily. Even if you don't have Kubernetes, we can provide you an RPM and instructions how to deploy it uh, manually on your cluster and that you have uh, work, right? It could be a virtual machine, uh, VMware, or Vernet, or anything you want to do. Yes. And that's actually pretty available from our, from our website as well, so you can play with this uh, for free. And again, you can come to us if you need enterprise features or you need support or opportunity new files. Right. Yes. So in uh, Presto, we use resource groups, uh, yes. which is a nice feature. Uh, question is where we can uh, have some uh, dynamic handlers to run. So when you get a query, we can dynamically, in runtime, decide what kind of resource we want to provide for that user in that context. Because, mm. for example, let's say you know one user starts scanning the system with lots of queries. Now we can, of course, manage it all externally, but it would be nice if we get like a lambda function, a handler, something that we can execute our own code in the context of the 
decision making of the resource. I see. Okay, so you want to you want a UDF for the resource groups? Yes, yeah, so yeah. UDF. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Uh, or, well, don't say that feature does not exist in Presta yet. Uh, but yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, you can take that and uh, you know talk about requirements in more detail and, and maybe help develop that functionality. Uh, Yes. We actually really do that for some of our biggest customers. They they have some unique needs, and we go ahead and design things for them and help them. Uh, well, you can help them to build that and contribute back to the open source. You can also just let us know and we can do that for them. So it's, it's, it's a possibility. So, so people need to go to sleep. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>